Welcome class, and uh, uh, this is uh, video number two of the uh, Mount SAC uh, capstone course that, uh, that we're engaged in. You should have seen video number one already. Uh, if you did see it, I guess you're going to agree uh, with me. It was kind of lame. I don't do this all the time, so uh, what can I say? I'm, I'm going to try to look into the camera a little bit better. I'm going to try to not be quite as nervous. I'm going to try to make it as enjoyable as possible, and I'm going to start by keeping it a little shorter, okay? So uh, anyway, I want to uh, you know, backtrack over some things that we talked about uh, that I want you to remember and always keep at the front of your mind, because this is really what we're trying to do with this class. And uh, first and foremost, among uh, those concepts uh, is the, the very first thing that I wrote on my whiteboard, uh, for the last video, which is competitive advantage. I guess I could have written this before. Competitive advantage. Okay, so for those of you that uh, forget what that means, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to keep telling you. It's the one thing I want you to remember uh, when you uh, leave this class. Competitive advantage means that you make more money than the average competitor in your industry. Now, that could mean, suppose you're losing money. Suppose you're losing $100 million. Could you have a competitive advantage? Yes, you could. How could you have a competitive advantage? That's right. Everybody in your industry is losing more money than that. And so it's not always quite so obvious uh, who has the competitive advantage. But you know, uh, you know some of the big companies that we uh, think about you know, in uh, the world today, like Amazon, for instance. Uh, Amazon lost money for most of uh, a decade. It probably lost money for a couple of decades. Uh, Tesla has lost money almost every quarter. They're, they're starting to turn it around now, but they've uh, lost money for, uh, for, for quite a while. In the case of Amazon, uh, they were a one-off. They, they really did not have any competitors uh, to speak of. And so they had a competitive advantage. They had a business plan. They basically had uh, budgeted to lose the money that they lost. I don't know how much it was, but maybe it was a billion dollars. Who knows? It could have been. So, but in their industry, which is online uh, retail, they had a competitive advantage. So, you know, think of these concepts uh, broadly. And uh, of course, you know, this is a uh, this is a uh, an art course. It's a music course. Uh, you're going to find places to and ways to uh, apply these concepts. Uh, competitive advantage is going to be applied to every kind of business. Simply because it's uh, a business in the arts, don't think that competitive advantage is unimportant. So, moving on. Okay, vision and mission. Vision and mission, right beneath competitive advantage, two of the most important concepts in any business. Vision and mission. Okay, so for those of you who have never given it a lot of thought, I brought an example. I brought my own vision and mission statement uh, to share with you today. Okay? So, my vision statement reads, our vision to provide the most creative soundtrack creation experience in the world. Uh, what do you think of that? Not so good, is it? It's, a, it's sort of what you would expect. You know, we're going to be the best. Uh, uh, you know, we want to we want to set the world on fire. Uh, it's a very little detail. And I'm going to tell you that that is not a very good vision statement. A vision statement 
uh, should refer to a distant uh, state of being, maybe uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years in the future. I think in the first video, I used the example of Toyota. They basically are going to be the leader in mobility because they don't know. They don't know, are we going to have automobiles? Who knows? Maybe we'll have flying cars. So uh, it'll be a, uh, a world where, you know, mobility or where these automobile companies are really making little airplanes. Or maybe it's going to be, uh, you know, beam me up, Scotty. You know, the uh, uh, molecular transporter. They don't know. But what they're saying is that regardless of how society and technology changes, they're going to be a leader in uh, mobility. I think it's really cool. It's a, a different way of looking at what uh, Toyota does. They're, they're saying we're not a car company. We're a mobility company. Okay, so how could I uh, improve my vision statement? So I said to provide the most creative soundtrack uh, creation experience uh, in the world. Well, suppose I had said uh, something like uh, uh, to be the leader in creative solutions uh, that may arise over the next generation thanks to uh, audio technology or to constantly reinvent the paradigm that is known as soundtrack creation. Uh, something like that, something that would uh, uh, elevate what I think I'm going to be in the next 20 years. I mean, today we know what I am. I'm a sound company. You know, the work comes through the front door, we do it and we send it out the back door and we collect our money. Okay, that's, you know, that's what uh, these businesses are like. That's what most businesses are like. But it does not hurt to have a higher calling. So you keep looking for that. Now there was a, a story that a professor told me uh, at Pepperdine and he said uh, uh, he had found a moving company uh, that essentially moved uh, high value artwork around the world. And their vision statement said uh, to create uh, world class solutions for the transport of priceless, uh, uh, priceless uh, uh, works of art uh, uh, um, around, around the world or, or globally or worldwide. So anyway, uh, it was actually printed on a, uh, on a business card and he was getting ready to uh, you know, teach his class. And uh, so he went on their website just to reconfirm what their vision statement was, and the vision statement was gone. And so he called the company to say, where's your vision statement? It, you know, I've got it on a business card, but it used to be on your website. And they said, well, you know, the board of directors was having a little bit of a disagreement about uh, the, uh, the wording of the vision statement. So until they could agree on the wording, they decided to take it down. They couldn't decide whether to use the word globally or worldwide. And until they decide and agree on it, well, they, they decided to just uh, you know, leave it off the website. And so this brings a, another point, which is uh, one of the purposes of a vision statement is to get your management team all on the same page. I mean, you know, if, if you're the owner of the company, the creator of the company, you kind of have an idea of where you want to be. You know, do you want to be big? Do you want to be worldwide? You know, do you want to be global? Uh, uh, what do you want to be? Do you want to change the world? Uh, do you want to be rich? Who, you know, who knows? There's all, all kinds of things. But if you have a management team of, let's say, 20 or 30 people, uh, how do you keep them on your page? Well, you publish your vision statement so they can read it and they can know why they're there. There used to be a... Uh, uh, not used to be, there is a company that we've all heard of called uh, General Electric, GE. And for many years, GE used to run uh, ads on uh, Sunday morning news shows. And it was basically, GE brings good things to life. And they would show uh, you know, pictures of medical equipment and uh, airplane engines, uh, uh, 
underwater exploration equipment. And you know, you're watching this and you say, well, this is all interesting, but what are they selling? What are they selling and who are they selling it to? Why are they running this ad? Well, the answer was very simple. They're running this ad for the 100,000 employees, 100,000 employees that they have around the world, 100,000. When you have 100,000 employees, how do you get them all on the same page? How do you make them proud of the company they work for? Well, you have a fantastic vision statement. Okay, we bring good things to life. And uh, you're also, uh, in the case of GE, you're also publishing these uh, uh, or making these commercials so that uh, you uh, can let your investors, the people that buy your stock and your bonds, let them know why they own, own your company, make them proud to own your company. And so that's, that's part of what vision is all about. So vision is to get everybody, well, to articulate a future state. Number one, articulate a future state. Where do you want to be in 25 years? Because wherever you are today, you know that's not where you want to stay. You can't just stay in one place. You either get bigger or you get smaller. Okay? And number two, get all of your management people on the same page. Make sure everybody has understood and bought into that vision. And number three, let all of your employees know where you're going, where the company is going. Uh, is this company just some guy sitting in an office picking up big paychecks and someday he's going to uh, close it down because he has enough? Or does he want it to be uh, a legacy company? Does he want it to go on you know, beyond uh, his involvement or her involvement? Uh, these are things that are important for employees to know and they need to be proud of where they work. Okay, that's vision. Mission is quite different. Mission is exactly the opposite of uh, vision. Mission talks about today. I knocked my sunglasses over. Vision, uh, mission talks about uh, today's state. Now, I think I got a pretty fantastic mission statement, if I do say so myself. I'm going to read it to you. Our mission, we provide creative, cost-effective solutions for, for soundtrack creation, working as accountable partners to the artists who entrust us with their projects. Okay? So what, is, uh, what does that mission statement do? That mission statement tells clients and staff how we measure success. What is our criteria for success and how do we measure it? So I'll go through it. We provide creative, okay, cost-effective solutions. Creative solutions, well, uh, that means that we're going to provide something for these uh, clients who bring their work to us uh, that they didn't think of. They're going to say, "Oh, Joe, that's fantastic! I didn't think I didn't think of that. I didn't think that uh, I didn't think that that would be a way to go." And you proved to me that that we could, okay. But they're not just creative solutions because creativity can be uh, cost prohibitive. So I add in, we provide creative, cost effective solutions. That means that you're going to be able to afford them. When I give you a sound package price of $30,000, you're going to get a creative solution for $30,000 because $30,000 is what you were able to afford. Okay? So we're not going to go back to the client and say, you know, uh, we were thinking about it and we wondered, would you like to pay a little bit extra to get a creative solution? We don't do that. You, you get the creative solution when you bring your work to us. So we provide creative cost-effective solutions for soundtrack creation. Okay, we're creating something, something that did not exist. I like the word soundtrack uh, creation because it uh, it burns into your brain the idea that we are making something that did not exist before. So soundtrack creation, we're creating something. Working as accountable partners. Okay, an accountable partner means that we are going to provide we are going to provide you with a great soundtrack. 
we're going to be accountable for that. If you, if you get to the end of the process and say, I'm not very happy with the, uh, the quality of this work, we're not uh, going to say something like, well, you should have told us, or we did everything you asked for. Uh, well, it's not our fault because, uh, you know, we thought that you wanted it this way. No, we have to be accountable partners, and we have to be partners. That goes back to the cost-effective part of this uh, mission statement, because as a partner, we don't profiteer uh, when things go wrong or go awry, or when there's a little bit of extra work that has to be um, that has to be done on a on a project. So we we work as your partner, and we're a partner to the artists who entrust us with their projects. So embodied in the mission statement is the recognition that the people that make films, the people that we work for, they're the artists. They're the ones with the vision. They're the ones that we're helping to realize their vision. They're artists. They're not just uh, you know, somebody that managed to put together a few bucks to make a film, okay? And the most important one, they're the artists who entrust us, entrust Smart Post Sound, with their projects, okay? Well, uh, that is a, a supercharged word because it embodies the word trust. They bring their project to us and they give it to us and they have full expectation that we're going to be able to uh, do a fantastic job. We're going to exceed every expectation because they trusted us to do that. Okay, and so if a client comes to me and says, "Well, you know, I got all these uh, these overage bills, and I, you know, I didn't approve them, and uh, I'm just shocked. It's not thirty thousand dollars anymore. Look, it's forty thousand dollars. You know, that's a, that's a big increase, and I didn't even know. Well, is that cost effective? No, it is not. Uh, are we accountable partners if we uh, build a client? Uh, to that extent without notifying them or getting their approval? No, we're not accountable partners. And we're not accountable partners, and yet they trusted us with their project, and what did we do? Well, what it looks like is that we used it to make a few extra bucks. That's not the kind of company that we are. And so if all of those things happened the way I just said them, we did not fulfill our mission statement. We didn't uh, execute it properly. And so uh, we are not successful. We did not fulfill the criteria for success. Okay? So both of these uh, concepts, especially vision, uh, come into play with the video that you have either already watched or you will be watching very soon uh, called Start With Why. Uh, with the, it's uh, by Simon Sinek. Okay, uh, what you're going to learn in that video is how vision and mission, but vision primarily, is the key to getting you uh, on the uh, curve, the uh, law of innovation of, dif uh, of diffusion, excuse me, law of diffusion of innovation. <clears throat> and um, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to draw it in this video, but uh, you watch you watch Start With Why, you can see it on YouTube, Simon Sinek, uh, let me write it. Okay, Simon Sinek. Start with why, and uh, that's something that we'll discuss in uh, either in class or in another video. So I want to just talk a little bit now about the um, about the course because uh, there's some things I'm going to need you to do uh, in order to uh, participate fully in the course. Uh, one of them is there's a lot of reading in the class, and the textbook. For this class is this baby here, okay? It's called the Content Trap, okay? I wish I could say that writer's name. I'm looking at it 
What I'm seeing is backwards. Let me just look here. Bharat Anand. It's a Harvard professor in uh, uh, business and media. It's a, fa it's a fabulous book. And uh, it's going to play into uh, another concept that I teach in this class. I think it's uh, probably the most uh, important concept uh, that you're ever going to um, learn in the, in the uh, study of media, music, uh, and content. Okay. Uh, it was told to me back in 1973 or 74 when I was in college by a professor, uh, he posed the question about uh, in media, what is the product and who is the buyer? And because we were in film school, we were thinking of you know, becoming filmmakers, TV producers, writers, and all that. It was obvious to us that the, uh, the, um, the, the product was the television show, the product was the movie, the product was the song, the product was what we were doing, what we were uh, creating, and obviously the buyer were the people that wanted to see the movie, see the television uh, project, uh, hear the song, okay? So that was so obvious. I mean, uh, how could he ask such a stupid question, right? Well, uh, he proceeded to tell me what I think is the most important thing I have ever learned in media, I'm going to tell you, along with competitive advantage, it's something that I want you to remember, okay? In all media, in all media, the product is the audience. And the buyer is the advertiser or whoever it is that wants to acquire that audience. Okay? It's not the, the music. It's not the movie. It is not the uh, TV show. The, uh, the product is the viewer. When you start looking at uh, media and what you do, what we all do, uh, in that light, you realize that as important as it is to uh, become proficient as a musician or as a writer or as a director or as a filmmaker, as important as that is, you're doing it as a means to acquire a product that's going to be sold to somebody else and that's how you're going to get paid. Okay? Keep thinking about it that way and as you uh, read the content trap, realize uh, that the, um, it's the connection between users that is really uh, the most powerful component of what we all want to do uh, when we get out into the world, and that is to monetize our art. You're not going to monetize your art by uh, writing another song. You're not going to monetize your art by, by uh, uh, writing another hundred songs. You're going to monetize your art by using your songs to create a community of people that want something else that they acquire through your songs. Okay? You need to think about what that could be. Okay? The content trap. Your first uh, week's uh, readings you should have done by now, but the first week's readings were uh, the introduction and chapters one and chapters two. Okay? So, when you read uh, on an online course for me, the way I know that you read is you outline your readings and then you turn it in and I grade you on it. I don't grade you, you know, for grammar or spelling or anything else. I just grade you that you did it. I'll check it to see if it, if it matches the chapters that you're outlining, right? And uh, that's how we go forward. If you outline, if you pick up a you know, a pencil, and you can do it longhand, or you can do it on the computer. If you do it longhand, I'll guarantee you there are studies that say you'll remember it. It's not quite as uh, powerful when you do it with the computer, okay? So you're going to do that. You're going to read that, and then you're going to um, uh, outline it. And the second book, 
Now this, look at this. I mean, this, this, this poor thing has been through the ringer. It's a book called The Medium is the Massage. Okay? The Medium is the Massage by Mar Marshall McLuhan. Now when he wrote the book, the title of the book was The Medium is the Message. But the printer made a mistake. It came to him with massage instead of message. And he said, you know, I think, uh, I think that actually is a lot more accurate than what I originally thought. Let's just leave it, okay? So the medium is the massage. It's one of the most important books in media. It is more relevant today than it was back in uh, the 1960s when he wrote it. Uh, and it's also very easy to read because, uh, look, lots of pictures, right? Not a lot to read. Lots and lots and lots and lots of pictures. So um, I'm going to want you to read that. You can probably read that in one sitting, okay? McLuhan's uh, concept really is that it's not the media. Now I'm going back to the, another theme about content. It's not really the content uh, that's being presented. It's the media uh, that it's being uh, viewed on that is informing the content, that's changing the content. Okay? Um, I think if you actually sit back and think about it, it really does seem obvious. But if you haven't thought about it and haven't applied it to uh, what you're doing, for instance, uh, you, compose, uh, you compose a song and you play it uh, in a theater, a theater setting, uh, you know, big, spe big speakers, large audience, you know, very impressive, a, a huge, huge impact. And that's great because, you know, you bring, you know, a thousand people in to hear your music and uh, that's kind of what we all dream about, but that's not how we experience media today. So suppose you, uh, suppose people experience your media, your song, your content uh, on a smartphone. First of all, fidelity goes out the window. So if fidelity goes out the window, other components of your song, like the lyrics, uh, and just the general feel of it uh, take precedence. But even more important, as uh, you know, for your uh, uh, listeners and for your the people that are experiencing uh, your content, for them to have portability and be able to listen to your product wherever they are, that's powerful. Uh, it's powerful for you as a creator. It's powerful for them. It gives them a lot of freedom, but it does change our concept of mass media. We don't have mass media in that model. It means you have a very fragmented kind of uh, uh, media. No more are you uh, reaching through radio and television, you know, millions of people at once. You're reaching millions of people or billions of people, but you're reaching them uh, you know, one uh, listen at a time. That's different. So, uh, so that and other concepts are things that we'll discuss with the medium is the massage. Okay. So we also are going to be doing, uh, you know, some papers. I'll talk about those in another uh, video that I do uh, for you, maybe video three. But uh, what I want to do to finish this one up, let's see how long we've been going. Okay. I just want to, uh, uh, let's see what we're going to do. I'm going to erase, I, wanna, I want to erase this board, but I can't. Oh, well. Okay. Okay, so last, uh, in the last video, and by the way, uh, you'll find the one that we're, that we're experiencing right now, that I'm making for you right now, it's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be called Mount Sac 2. The, the first video I did, Mount Sac 1. And that's how you're going to find them. Uh, unless I can figure out a way to post the videos on Canvas. So far, I haven't been able to do that, okay? 
So last uh, session, in the last video, uh, we, we finished up with the external environment, if you remember. And the external environment consisted of six uh, components. It was It was, number one, demographic. Two, sociological. Three, economic. Four, political. Five, uh, technological. And six, global. Okay. So I wanted you to just refresh your memory with all six of these. Going to hold it up long enough. Oh, you can always pa pause the video so you can write them down. But these really fall into the heading, under the heading of uh, the world creates the conditions that we take advantage of in business to, uh, to make uh, returns, to make money, to make profits. And sometimes when we're working in music or the arts of any kind, all we want to do is put paint on canvas or play our guitar or, uh, you know, make a movie. Uh, that's our world. And meanwhile, there is a real world going on around us at all times. And in that world, things are developing and changing that are going to provide opportunities for people, us, to uh, adjust our approach a little bit and maybe make a little bit more money. So I think in the last video, I mentioned that uh, for our industry, music uh, and film and television and media in general, you know, tech, the technological uh, aspect of the uh, external environment is so, vi you know, so vitally important. It's a game changer. It basically makes everything better or cheaper. And so you have to be watching the developments in the uh, technological aspect of the uh, of the external environment in order to capitalize on uh, you know, some of the opportunities that are going to make money for you. Uh, the global aspect is likewise, because we live in a, we live in a world that uh, is getting a lot smaller. In fact, uh, uh, Thomas Friedman wrote a book called The World is Flat. And the concept of the book was that when you go to India uh, and you look at what they have available in India, you see Microsoft, you see Apple, you see all of the logos because all of the technological support and help centers are, are stationed in India today. And what's happening is, yes, you have people who you know, joke about getting somebody on the phone from India or some other foreign country about their accent and you know how hard it was. And makes, you know, as Americans, it makes us feel pretty smug no, we're good, they're not. But it's changing. It's changing so dramatically. And uh, uh, he points out that in these help centers in uh, Mumbai, Italy, you actually have floors and sections of those floors that are uh, set up with different uh, ge geographical uh, standards. So you have Northeastern United States and the people that work there they have that accent down pat. You've got the South, you've got the West, uh, you've got you know, Canadians, you've got uh, all of this um, sociological, global, and demographic uh, change. It's like, a, it's like a big Petri dish of what's going on in the world today. And it's all designed really to bring the world together, closer. It's designed to do things more cheaply from the standpoint of technical support, well, you know, guess what? In uh, Mumbai, it used to be that, uh, you know, a young Indian uh, a man or woman 
who was involved in technology, they had to try to come to the United States because that's where all of the uh, technology was happening. Not anymore. Now they can work for Apple in technical support and technology right in Mumbai. They don't have to leave their families. They don't have to leave their culture. And so uh, that is a huge, huge uh, change, which in our business you can take advantage of. You can see how you can take advantage of it. Because, uh, you know, you, for one thing, you're going to be able to sell your products. In our case, the product that we sell, that we make, uh, is uh, music. Okay. I don't want to confuse you, though. You make the music, and you go to India, and you acquire a product. The product is a billion and a half Indians who uh, can consume your product and can be sold to uh, American advertisers because guess what? The world likes American products and they will buy them. So, um, so the global aspect of the external environment is very important to, uh, to understand. And the, way, and the way that you monitor the external environment is really so simple. Read the newspaper. I read two newspapers every day. I read the Wall Street Journal and I read uh, the New York Times. That's all it takes. Now, you, you, I know most people today, young people, they get their news from, uh, you know, online sources and, and you name it. I don't care where you get your uh, news from, but uh, you have to do it on a daily basis. It has to be part of your uh, daily routine because in this world, and this is the last thing I'm going to leave you with uh, in this video, in this world, the people that get ahead and rise to the top. Yes, sometimes they are just phenomenal prodigies who uh, you know, can play and sing and, and do musically things that nobody else can do. But the 99.9% .9 of the rest of us, we get ahead because we know, we know about things. We find out and we tell others and we get thought of as knowledgeable. And once we're thought of as knowledgeable, uh, organizations want our services. So I'll leave you with that for this video. I don't want to go too long. And um, I'll see you online. Uh, currently, I have us on Tuesdays, so we'll see if that works. Uh, I'm told that it's very loose. I don't know how loose it is, but we'll find out. Uh, so until uh, next time, uh, this is Joe Melody saying, uh, do your reading, do your outlining, and show up in class, and you'll do good. Okay? Talk to you later. Bye.